Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today, Ed, we're going to look at some of the work of David Cho, some of the comics work of David Cho. Rare morsels, man. Less less pages than a, like a Jim Steranko, but uh, everyone influential. I'm going to start with the Expo 2000. This was the issue that was edited by Tom Devlin and... Uh, you know, some of these are going to be a much easier to get hold of than others. And I mentioned this one because this is one I think you might be able to track down. And it's a really good one. This is the best of the SPX anthologies, in my opinion. I think they must have done them for 10 years or something. But if you're looking at this contributor list, it's incredible who is in this this issue. It's really top notch. And it starts with a Charles Burns cover, so you can't go wrong there. Um and David Cho preceded by uh, Adrian Tomini, followed by Dean Haspiel in, in here. So you'll see there's a few Adrian Tomini strips scattered throughout. But it's really a, a great list of alternative cartoonists, especially a snapshot of the year 2000. This is a pretty good a pretty good glimpse at who was doing what at that time. So this is not a major story, but it is in his style. You'll see the cutout text that's applied. Um, also does hand lettering on top of drawings. And I don't know if this is drawn in pencil or not. Um, he does a lot of photocopying, which would make your pencil lines much darker. And this is a story of him skateboarding along and uh, getting harassed by kids who are several years younger than him. Throw it, one of them throwing a book at him while he's skateboarding. And so uh, he kind of gets into this little altercation with these kids. It's a pretty short kind of a, I don't want to say a throwaway story, but a, a relatively short, certainly not what I would know him for. If this is all I saw, it might not register with me. But again, as you say, didn't do comics very long. So you got to take what you can get if you're interested in his work. So little short comic, funny, self-contained, short story. This is Jordan Crane's non-issue number four. And in issue number three and four is where Slow Jams, sort of one of the places it appeared, at least parts of it. And he met Jordan Crane. They both live in L.A. So... I think they met via uh, Comic-Con or something and recognized at that point he, David Cho had made like mini comic zine kind of versions of Slow Jams. And when Jordan Crane saw those, he wanted to run them in non. And so this is part two. It was, uh, ran across two issues. To give some context, man, like, let's imagine, you know, uh, what San Diego Comic-Con must have been like in 1999 or, or, or 98. Uh, what was independent comics at that time? It was... It was still all the same people who were doing shit for the past 10 years up to that point. You know what I mean? There was very little new energy. And then this comes along. Yeah, this would stand out just about at any time. And uh, I'm not going to point this one out too much because we're going to go through Slow Jams page by page. But if you happen to come across an issue of Non, you should get it anyway. This is another exceptional uh, indie alternative anthology. Jordan Crane, top notch. I as a designer and producer, so always worth your time, but issues three and four, you'll find the David Show Slow Jams, uh, at least part of that story in Non. And then this was the last issue of Non. This is Non number five, and uh, this is quite a book. Hand silkscreen cover, wraparound covers for this. There are a couple of Zurich award-winning books that come inside of this. What a package. I was following Jordan Crane at the time, and I can remember him sort of talking about assembling these kits. Not easy. You do, I don't think you do two of these. What was the... Uh, what year did this come out? Um, this would have been probably 2003, something around that time. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a year for it. Jason. Start off with Jason, probably some of the first time I saw Jason's artwork. The first Jason appearance on the Kayfabe channel, might I add, Ben, which is a crime. Yeah, that is. <laughs> That's an indictment of us. Uh, there should be a year on here somewhere. 2001. So this is this is before Kramer's really fires up as like the alternative indie art comics anthology. And the story that's in here is pretty substantial. So we'll go through this one a little bit, point out some features. But this is Bike. Look at uh, those hand styles, man. He comes from graffiti culture, so you know he's going to make that shit look correct. And then photocopying. Something, you know, one of his tools like a pencil or a, a paintbrush or something especially when it comes to his comics. And so it's the story of a uh, young David Cho who has a skateboard that he makes out of an end table and wood shop. Pretty fun. But uh, he ends up getting hold of a bike. His aunt gives him this purple bike that he rides for a little bit, gets made fun of because it's purple, throws it in his garage. Eventually, he needs some kind of transportation. So he pulls the bike out, spray paints it black, and that's what he runs around to, to school and to whatever else he has to do. 
all good stuff. Very personal writing style, too, I think, is one of the things that draws you, uh, you know, draws a reader into this stuff. And so one day he's coming out of, uh, you know, somewhere he stops for dinner or whatever, comes out, and his bike's been stolen. Time goes by. You know, I mean, he's devastated, of course. Uh, and there's, there's that effect where when you're uh, on the Xerox machine, you, you move the, the art a little bit, and you get that distorted effect. Yeah, you'll see that a few places. Also, you'll, you'll notice, like, I mentioned him cutting out, printed out lettering and, and pasting it on, but also drawing and painting letters. Very uh, adventurous, you know, in terms of how he's laying out the story. And he, and he sort of does this with the images, too, and the way images link. Like, he'll have side images that aren't... If you're thinking of Scott McCloud's panel to panel, it's really pushing how these images connect. It's certainly not that moment-to-moment -moment kind of thing that we think of as, like, cinematic storytelling. So eventually what happens is he finds the bike. Like, like two years later, when he no longer needs the bike, he comes across the bike one day chained up outside of a business, and so he starts stalking it and waiting for the person to come out and really kind of, like, fantasizing about how this is going to go, leaves a, uh, a, a threatening note on the bike, uh, you know, dear bike thief. <laughs> And so it's just a ramp up of this anticipation of what do you do with this? He doesn't even need a bike anymore. At this point, he has a car, but it's still the idea of it. This bike meant a lot to him when it was stolen and now he's found it again. Um, I got to point out this panel to me, like this is a really cool action panel, very much in line with something you would see in a Marvel comic or something. You know, imagine Daredevil jumping from rooftop to rooftop, kind of a cool shadow. And I've actually seen this in other stories of his. So you know, like I've heard him talk about drawing the same images over and over, which mm. a lot of artists do. And so I don't know if this is an actual copy or if this is just another iteration of the same sort of concept composition. So finally, uh, he does find the person comes out, gets on their bike, rides home. He follows them home, which leads to a confrontation. And uh, it's a girl that stole his bike. So he gets into it kind of with her. She laughs at him a little bit and starts to drive away. And he starts pounding the shit out of the bike with a hammer and just pretty much ruining the bike is, is what happens. You know, neighbors come out and watch and, and all of this stuff. And it's not satisfying at all. So you end up with a couple of pages of him reflecting on this process and how unsatisfying this whole thing was, like stomping this bike into pieces. We have a, we have a word for that here in the Kayfabe uh, Studios. Anticlimactic. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's that's what you get out of this story. But it's a pretty interesting story for, I think, several reasons, a lot of them visual. But I think the writing, too, is, is kind of up to the task. Yeah. Which and, is rare. And, you know, auto bio comics kind of live and die with that narration. Yeah. And to be clear, the anticlimactic thing is what he's feeling, not the yes. comic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, and does a good job of kind of spelling that out. You know, like there is anticipation for several pages that spread across several days. When was the last time you thought of a spork? <laughs> Just now, Ed? <laughs> Before this, uh, 2014? <laughs> anyway, Non, again, one of the great anthologies, alternative anthologies, if you happen upon one of these. Um, kind of the, I would say, predecessor to something like Kramer's Ergo. All right, now this is the reason why Steve Ballmer is, is watching this episode. This is the reason why, you know... Who else, Ben? Uh, this is this is our kayfabe effect on my copy of Slow Jams. This will be going up for sale after this. <laughs> Howard Stern is watching this episode. <laughs> David Cho gets on my radar around this time. Uh, Slow Jams published in 1999 with the with a Zurich grant, and this is this is sort of the perfect bound edition. He had done a mini comic version of this thing, like a zine, first, and that's I think what put him on the radar of several people, like Jordan Crane for Non. Uh, but what led to the Zurich Grant application and then putting out kind of this deluxe edition. Um, so the way I learn about him is I'm getting into indie alternative comics in the late 90s. Comics Journal, best of 1999. These things were invaluable for me. This is early days of the internet, but cartoonists weren't very well represented there. So this is where I would find like the list of stuff that I need to track down. And they would, you know, have a bunch of different cartoonists, publishers, editors, just kind of submitting their best five books of the year, for example. Um, Probably number one this year would have been like Dave Cooper's Weasel number one. This is also where uh, Al Columbia gets on my list for a short story that he did in Blab Anthology. And uh, that's another one we're going to need to look at at some point, Ed. A few cartoonists we mentioned this episode that we're behind on. Um, but this is where I would find a lot of information. And so a couple of people call out Slow Jams. Uh, James Kachalka says, The book is sloppy and exciting, amazingly well-drawn and beautiful, but also poorly drawn and ugly. 
It's feverishly written and vigorously drawn, so feverish and vigorous that the art cascades between brilliance and a sort of ugly maimed incoherence, and the story is stunning and the plot unexpected. It's great. Scott McCloud. How much range is there between James Kachalka and Scott McCloud? So Scott McCloud, um, the last thing in the world I would have expected to like, but I did a lot. And Robert Young, the comics interpreter, and uh, says brings a real street sensibility to his comics. In this way, his stuff reminds me a lot of Jaime Hernandez's Locust story, stories, in that the characters feel real and have the depth and grit of ex exhibited by honest to god human beings, but so rarely captured by their comic book approximation. I Pretty have, high praise. I have those comics interpreters too, but I just I, I couldn't find them in time for the for the episode. Well, that's all right. We've got the book. Yes. So, the, the, you know, except no substitute, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a kind of an overview of where this is coming out of, because it's more or less his debut comic and a very strong debut. So you see his paintings on the cover already. This looks different than any comic I was picking up in 1999. And anybody that follows my work, I think you'll recognize some of the way he mixes media in here. And there were, you know, a few people that were starting to do this kind of stuff with paper stocks and color printing and things. Look at this, man. It, it, makes, tour you de think, force. it makes you think of like skin, right? That's the first thing I think of, especially with that blue color. The uh, the Brendan McCarthy graphic novel, yeah, Carol with the Carol Swain flavor, because like, you know, those are like, I mean, I, and I'm sure this is just coming from his own place. I don't know that he even, even fucks with those comics or anything. Right. It just, my I know he might. My limited artistic vocabulary, uh, you know, only goes so far. So a couple pages of painted comics. This is some text that he found about uh, not masturbating. <laughs> Interesting collage stuff. This is a short story about a guy that gets out of prison and then decides he's better off in prison and so commits a crime to get back to prison uh, because he just can't he can't fit in. I hope young people still do this shit, man, where you get the name tag stickers at the at the local uh, corner store and then do some cool art, put them on the uh, mailboxes and stuff. Let's see some cartoonist kayfabe ones out there. And a little bit of background on him. So... This was something that I would see like Paul Pope would often do, you mm -hmm. know, have some text pages and really kind of insert his personality into the book. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm down with that. I'm trying to learn anything about any cartoonist. So I appreciated that. And then we get into the into the main story. And uh, most of the story is like this. It's kind of a slightly off black ink, a very dark, maybe blue ink. Um, not too saturated, though. It's almost black. And then using photocopies and whatever art materials he feels like drawing with. And this very beginning is, is kind of cool because he's driving home. I think it's after uh, after school, after a semester, and he shuts off the lights. He's talking about driving at night, and there's nobody on the road. And when he shuts off the lights, you know, it's almost like floating in space. And he gives a lot of background um, in an autobiographical way, like what he's doing at this time. Um, he's working for uh, some hip-hop artists making jewelry, which I thought is kind of interesting in hindsight. You see him there, like, smelting or melting down metals in order to, I guess, cast these different pieces of jewelry and then points out some of the stuff that he's made. Lives in L.A., so he's moving back to L.A. from Oakland and uh, living with the parents and just auto-bio stuff. You know, it's just a snapshot of early 20s life. This is one of the most probably famous comic sequences that David shows has made. This is the two page masturbation sequence. This is, this is amazing. Like I've shown this in classes when I talk to students and in hindsight, maybe this isn't the right piece to show anymore, but it's so interesting because he's, he's doing things with time. He's doing things with images and linking those images up. It's a really interesting, like you could probably teach a comics class on this spread because of what he's doing. And so he's talking about these different images and ideas and how much time he spends with those, with the times calculated based on strokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, got to shout out the wizard, the wizard reference here of a Gen 13 cover uh, on the stands and in his mind, minus the uh, the costumes. Issue number 44, the, my, the most important issue in my young life, man, because that was the one with the Kubert School art, uh, article. And uh, Dave Cho sullied it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably made it appeal to some other people, though. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, so kind of an amazing sequence. And like I'm reading this 
shortly after reading something like Chester Brown's, you know, Yummy Furs and I Never Liked You, similar material, you know, this is a little bit of an older character, but the same idea of like, what are these comics? I've never read anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. He's got to be about my age because like some of the references, you know, they line up with, you know, like the Wizard Magazine. He's 44. Okay, so I'm 43. So, you know, like seeing that again, like I used to talk about I Never Liked You by Chester Brown speaking to me because it was a middle schooler and I was like in high school or whatever. I mean, this is even closer now. You know, like a lot of references are going to be exactly in line with my age. So his buddy uh, comes back from wherever he's going to school on the East Coast or something. He comes back to L.A. and he invites him out to uh, go to a dinner party with his his friend's girlfriend is having a dinner party with like kind of her employees. So this is our dinner, dinner party. And you talk about that loose drawing style. I would have been, if you showed me one picture from this book at the time, I would have been like, eh, it's lousy. And somehow it works perfect once you start reading it. It reminds me a little bit, because it's very immediate, of Eddie Campbell's Graffiti Kitchen, which also has like a very deliberate drawing style that is supposed to evoke like an immediacy. Yeah. And I think that you get some of that in in certain drawings uh, in this comic. It's the kind of drawing that those like court reporter sketch artists wish they could do. Yes. And he's good at going into and doing details like a face or an expression in the middle of like the madness and chaos of this stuff. He can kind of draw your eye right into a focal point. And in this case, it's this this girl Yun Mi who he falls for. Basically, uh, love at first sight at this dinner party. And so he runs into the uh, the girl's bathroom. We saw this in non number four. Uh, runs into his friend's girlfriend's bathroom to try to clean up because he's kind of you know college student Do- running running hot. Do- documentary's called Dirty Hands. There you go. And, and when you see him him with uh, Anthony Bourdain at the Sizzler, a lot of ink and paint on those hands. Working artist man. So uh, while he's dolling himself up and singing in the mirror, Yun Mi actually opens the door and, and catches him doing this. Pretty, pretty, uh, little embarrassing. How about this? Dropping in the Last Supper photocopy in again, not stuff that I was seeing in comics. Like that's part of the attachment is it was so revolutionary. Like this broke almost every rule I thought I knew about making comics. This completely broke all of them. I'm not even sure how you make this. Yeah, shit. Like I could do it in Photoshop. Sort of, <laughs> but I mean, some of the some of the Xerox effects are just out there. So he 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 goes from this party and thinking about this girl that he's very interested in and trying to talk to and and make some connection with to then reflecting on his experience with girls. And so this is like his first girlfriend, and he's looking back on it, and she broke his heart essentially is what the story is. He liked her more than she liked him is the crux of this, but he still kind of captures that sense of feeling you know, of, of being so excited to see her when she would show up and does a good job of like capturing that emotional part. Uh, and the, the horror of whenever she lets him know that she's just not as interested in him as, as he is in her. And, uh, there's the repeat of that panel that I, that I had mentioned previously. So he writes a letter. I like this. This is uh, something that spoke to me too, is just from a drawing standpoint. Drawing these kinds of things, impossible. And I'm sure that he was drawing from life for these, yeah. which makes it much easier. But it still spoke to me because I had no comics that looked like this. And this just looked really cool to me. And, um, you know, if you think of it as sort of like a montage in the middle of a comic, you don't see that many of those. Yeah, it's a, it's a version of the Dan Klaus, sh- the Stroll mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, and a very, a very different, you know, a very different perspective on that type of event. So back to the party, they're talking, whatever, and then you and me, a car pulls up and she basically goes running over. It's her boyfriend, and uh, she's excited to see him, and off they go. Well, that's not enough. <laughs> so David Cho is, is still uh, interested, or his character is still interested in this girl. He writes a letter, gives it to his friend to give to his girlfriend to get to you and me. And the crux of the letter is, you're amazing, I like you a lot, uh, I will be outside of the, the Man Chinese Theater yeah. a certain date every year. Just show up there. And so then we get into this like weird, like the, the story takes a turn where it becomes this weird fantasy of he goes on living his life and every year he goes to meet her and she never shows up. And something like five years pass, he becomes a, uh, graduates from college with a bachelor's d- degree in masonry and becomes a successful artist. 
and eventually, <laughs> he's like working out and stuff, you know, he's, he's, he's living his best self. He's, get, he's getting prepped, man. And eventually, one day, there she is. Awesome. Super fantasy, right? Well, it's too good to be true, even though he's floating on air, literally in this drawing, whenever he first sees her and whenever they first connect. And before you know it, it turns out to be a sick ruse between her and her longtime boyfriend who found the letter and decides they're going to go wreck this dude. Wow. Yes, right? How, how strange is this? Again, 1999, I'm, I'm reading this and going, what am I reading? And so the rest of the book, for the most part, is those dudes beat the shit out of him, and then they take him, they throw him in his trunk, which reminded me of Stray Bullets, David Lapham. I wasn't totally without reference point for this kind of a story. You know, I could get on board. Right. I just had to shift gears a little bit. Uh, but they take him to La Brea Tar Pits, where they're going to dump him, you know, basically kill him, throw him in the, in the tar pits. And you see pictures of, like, his face all stomped in and stuff, like his nose is destroyed, his front teeth are busted out. And uh, they're ready to throw him into the La Brea Tar Pits when I think the, an ambulance comes. I think the guard calls them. And uh, they chase off the, his attackers and they take him to a hospital strapped down in the gurney and everything. But he doesn't want that. Like he's decided now he's, he's going to commit suicide. It's such a strange, strange story. So he flees the, the hospital, runs out, and then this afterlife section actually finds him sneaking into a high-end hotel, uh, shitting on the bed, and uh, basically re-embracing life. Finding a new affirmation for life in this, in this weird post-fantasy, uh, you know, love, heart, heartbreak. You don't, get, you don't get two cartoonists like this in a generation? No, you don't. You don't get two books like this. No. It just doesn't happen. Uh, one of the fantasies in here is when he thinks they're going to blow his brains out, and he references having the blood splatter on a Pete Maudrillon painting. Uh, comparing it to the sidewalk, and so you get to see like the Norman Rockwell uh, <laughs> doctored up image. It's really kind of radical stuff. Talking about some of the characters, some of the process, letters that people write to him, and then giving some uh, thanks and, and notes to people that helped along the way, the Zurich Foundation, stuff of that sort. And again, mixing up this media and artwork, showing that, that off. Hell of a book, man. And it left a mark on me. This was not a comic that I had read anything like this before or since. But at the time, you know, like, this is the direction that I've really gone in looking at zines, looking for things that I haven't seen before. And this was a pivotal time. That that comics journal, that 1999 best of, at some point maybe we'll go through that issue because so many important cartoonists come out of that issue for me. It's whenever, uh, as you say, Ed, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Right. That is the moment for me. It's whenever I had completely given up on like the new comics day kind of stuff, but I still loved comics. And that comics journal really gave me a checklist of like, well, go buy Weasel number one. Go look at Al Columbia. Um, you know, and, there, and there's a whole list of those those people that are in that issue that are very important to me. And this one is part of that. You know, it's a short list that came out of there that kind of shaped my direction to this day. 1999, Zurich Grant winner. And they would distribute these grants two times per year, once in March, once in September. And David Cho got the uh, the March uh, Zurich uh, Prize. September, Kayfabe Lieutenant Tom Scioli, 1999, got his Zurich wow. grant for uh, the Myth of Eight Opus, man. So I have to shout him out. For sure. Any other standouts on there? Oh, yes, sir, man. Uh, Nick Bertozzi, Leela Corman, uh, Jason Shiga. These are these are a part of the, the, the Tom period of time. What a uh, list of cartoonists right there. Don't quite recognize any of the other people from uh, David Cho's quarter or whatever. Carrie Goulis for Alternator. That was a book that I tracked down, I think, mail order. Um, that was, was good. But those Zerich Awards, man, that whole list is... I tried to get a Zerich and didn't. And yeah. I wish I was part of that list because that is some noteworthy people. Jason Shiga, man, one of, one of my favorite cartoonists. Usually what happens, uh, honestly, sort of like David Cho... Um, these people, they, they get the money, they put the book out, but that isn't where their aspirations end, and they go on to bigger and better. Like, I'm sure we Google any of those names, man. They're, they're doing just fine, doing something cool and interesting. And uh, certainly, we know David Cho went on to a bigger and better, even though he didn't do very many more comic pages after this. Yeah, so that's... Uh... That's a lot of his comics. We may have looked at half his comics that he's done here today. We may have looked at more than half of them. Um, as you say, didn't, didn't do a lot more. But, you know, 
sometimes quality is what counts. And uh, this was certainly an important book for me. I don't know about you, Jimmy, but I feel inspired by looking at this. Whenever I take a look at uh, David Cho's work, whenever I see him in a video grinding some stuff out, it always makes me want to loosen up my sketchbook. Draw, like, it's easy to do in sketchbooks, but it's I, I'm so fearful of putting that kind of work on the page, man. But practice makes perfect. Nah, doubt it. <laughs> we'll try it. We'll try anyways, though, man. Uh, K favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon so that we can notify you when the next videos are available. We're on that race to 20,000 subscribers, man, so make that happen. And you got to hit that bell to mitigate that kayfabe effect, man, because we talk about books and they sell like crazy. And if you want it, you want to get in early before the cost becomes prohibitive. I bet you Slow Jams is going through the roof right now. Take a look, kayfabers. <laughs> You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merch at the links below this video. All right, man. I think the, the first exercise I'm going to do, I'm going to try to draw with my left hand. <laughs> Give them the marching orders, Jimmy. Read more comics. <laughs>